My chess friends, I warmly welcome you to this chess video and I must humbly apologise for not having uploaded a video for some time. My computer in fact broke. So I had to get a new motherboard, a new chip, a new heatsink, a new fan, new RAM, put them all together, fired her up, loaded up the Linux and now she is running smoothly and beautifully. I'm happy to um, see. Now what can you expect to learn from this little chess lecture here? Because we're going to take a look at another master versus amateur game. Well, we'll take a look at the loss of the initiative in the opening phase of a chess game through making passive moves. We'll take a look at this, the centre fort trick, which comes as a direct consequence of a pseudo sacrifice. We'll take a look at the premature pinning of the king's knight. Normally on f3 or in the case of black if the knight is on f6. We'll take a look at an attack against an uncastled king. How to open up the position. And we'll take a look at how to transform an advantage in space or an advantage in development into some other type of advantage. In the case of this game, a material advantage. And we'll take a look at how to restrict our opponent's pieces. So all good and healthy things to make your chess healthy and strong. Now the game is interesting because there are times when despite having such an advantage in development, a chess player must settle for converting it into some other type of advantage. For example, a material advantage, rather than trying to continually accumulate an advantage of sheer force. And it's very true to say that while the former is transitory, a material advantage, if you can keep it, is generally more permanent. And this is what we will see in this game of chess here. So it begins with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3 and knight f6. The four knights variation which we have looked at already. Now this might be a good opening to employ against a stronger player because of the symmetry. And it might be hard for them to break down the symmetry without incurring some weakness in their position. There are various moves here for white. In the actual game, white played the move d3, which is a very passive move. And it yields the initiative to black because it puts no pressure on the black centre. Black is free to do whatever he likes. It's not really our aim here to go into the theory of the four knights variation. But there are other moves, bishop to b5 for example, which at least puts some pressure on the black centre. And this is termed the Spanish variation. 
there's bishop to c4, which is called the Italian variation. And this leads to the very famous pseudo sacrifice, the center fork trick. And I'll show you here. Knight takes on e5. Now, white is not forced to recapture, but if he does recapture with the knight, it illustrates the idea because here black will play the move d5. After bishop to d3, black must regain material equality. White recaptures, putting pressure on the bishop, sorry, the knight, and thus pressure on the pawn. Therefore, black plays the move bishop to d6. D4, challenging the center, takes, takes, on C6, doubling the black pawns, and then retaking with the queen. And you can see that these double pawns here, but in compensation, black has easy development and two bishops. And whoever is best able to take advantage of these dynamics, Will probably win this chess game. So that is the center fort trick. As I said, that white is not, of course, forced to take immediately here on e4, and he can, in fact, make another pseudo sacrifice on f7 after black takes, then he takes on e4. Black builds a solid center. Knight comes to g5. King runs away to safety. Challenges the center. Kicks the knight. Takes, takes, and takes. And you can see that it is white that has the shattered pawn structure in this instance. Black has better pawns and probably better mobility as well. I just thought I would highlight the center fort trick to you, my chess friends. You will see it in this the juxtaposition of these pieces when there is a knight, a bishop, and a pawn here. In this way here. But as we said, in the actual game, white played the very passive d3, handing the initiative over to black. In the game, black played the move bishop to c5, which invites the center pawn trick because you can see the juxtaposition of these pieces here. If white likes, he can play knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and d4. And here we now have it from the perspective of the black side. And it's white that has the two bishops and the shattered pawn structure in this instance. And black that has the better pawns. That in fact never transpired during this game. Because white in fact played bishop to g5, pinning the king's knight against the queen. Now, as a rule, it's often better to wait until one's opponent has castled before pinning the knight, the king's bishop, sorry, the king's knight. Because after this move, h6, this move can become a real weakness if the king has castled already. There is, of course, A counter strategy, if you like, to this rule of pinning the king's knight. And I'll show you what it is here. If we have the idea of taking the center by taking this knight, black is forced to recapture, the knight comes to d5, the queen goes back, and then playing a move like c3, taking the center like this, then it might be a good idea. But it's usually better to wait until one's opponent's king has castled because this move h6 can become a real weakness for him. Now, in the actual game, 
white played, sorry, yeah, white played the very dubious bishop to h4. And it's dubious because it allows a ready-made kingside attack after the move, g5. The bishop is forced back, and after a move like d6, you can see that this pawn flanks here has entombed the poor bishop here on g3. And Jose Raul Capablanca has some very fine games where he manages to entomb an opponent's bishop like this. Because what it means is that on the opposite side of the board, your opponent will be essentially a piece down, even though the piece is on the board. Because it's entombed within this pawn chain here. Very interesting positional idea. White played h3, preparing a square of sanctuary, or as some people call it, a love square, for the bishop here in case of h5, h4. And here black played the beautiful bishop to d6. Look at this bishop here. Look how it radiates. On these two diagonals. It's absolutely beautifully placed here. And when we compare it to its counterpart, we can see the superiority of this bishop. And here, White engages in a very dubious maneuver. His idea is to bring this bishop, this knight to e2, c1, b3, and hassle this bishop here. I don't really understand it myself. If Wyatt had wanted to hassle this bishop, he could have simply played a move like knight to h4. Sorry, knight to a4. But he engages in this long maneuver, and here is a loss of tempi. Black develops, knight comes to c1, black again castles, developing the rook. And let us just take a look at this for a moment and count the pieces. You can see that white has one, sorry, black has one, two, three, four, five, six developed pieces. And one, two, three, four pawns. White has two developed pieces and three pawns. A huge lead in development for black. White carries out his dubious manoeuvre and eventually hassles the bishop a little. Bishop drops back. And again, another dubious manoeuvre, resulting in the loss of tempi, knight to d2. Black plays the excellent rook to e8, preparing to open up the position, putting his rook opposite the white king. Bishop to e2. And now that black has completed his development, well, he's free to attack in the centre and open up the position and take advantage of his superiority in development. By the excellent d5. e takes d5, bishop takes d5 is more forcing than knight takes d5 because it threatens the g2 pawn. And what is white to do in this position? If he castles, he's castling into an attack. H5 is coming, F5 is coming, and these pawns are coming very fast. So rather than castling into an attack, he plays bishop to F3. Bishop takes, queen takes, knight to D4, and the queen is forced back because of this familiar theme here, threatening to fork the king and rook, win a pawn, and e4, excellent, opening up the position against the castled king. And the position for the white king here is very perilous indeed, and black is using this threat of winning a pawn to try and prevent white from castling. 
But why is forced to castle in this position? Because it's simply too dangerous to leave the king in the centre like this. So castles. Black takes on b3 first. Knight takes. E takes. C takes. Queen takes d3. Queen takes d3. And rook takes d3. And black has converted his superiority of space and development into a material advantage. Okay, it might seem that it's simply a measly pawn, but it's enough to win a game of chess. King to h2. Black was of course threatening to take the bishop here because it's This pawn here is pinned and is not really protecting this bishop. So king to h2 is kind of forced. h5. And let us observe the mobility of white's pieces just for a moment. Look at this bishop here. It can hardly move. In fact, it cannot move. This knight here is restricted by this bishop here. Can it come here? Sorry. Can it come here or here? Severely restricted by its movement. Rook a to e1, trying to secure the e5 square for the bishop in case of h5, h4. Rook takes, rook takes. H4, bishop e5 is only square. Bishop takes f2 is prosecuting a much more serious threat. Rook to f1, knight to e4 defending the bishop, knight to c1, and rook to d5. Bishop to c3, it's a choice of a lesser evil, I suppose. Checks. King drops back. Takes. Simply to reduce the number of pieces on the board because in the end game, of course, pawns are more valuable than pieces. Takes. Shattering the pawn structure. And f5. C4 was played, rook simply dropped back to a5, knight to b3, takes, takes here, and b6, restricting the movement of this knight. Because it might have been dangerous if this knight came to the c5 square in conjunction with the rook coming here with mating attacks, and that would be just simply a tragedy for black. So he plays this excellent move here, simply restricting the movement of this knight. c5, rook to b2, c6, again it's quite a tricky move. Some back rank mate threats here, against the black king. But black has this excellent manoeuvre. Rook to f1, which essentially forces the rook back. You then can use the tactic of deflection, trying to deflect it. And because the king is blocking the path of the rook, Black can in fact win more material. And after king to e2 and bishop to f4 blocking the rook's access to the f8 square, black in fact resigned. Sorry, white in fact resigned. So very, very interesting game of chess, I thought. Carrying all the themes that we mentioned. If we can just quickly go back.
We saw the passivity of this move d3, which handed the initiative over to black. We looked at the center fort trick. Premature pinning of this knight here, which tragically for white led to a ready-made kingside attack. The bishop was entombed. Engaging in some very dubious manoeuvring with the knights. Which leads to the loss of tempi and a huge lead in development for black. Which black opened up the position. And converted this lead in development. In space into a material advantage. We looked at the restriction of these pieces. Trying to gain the e5 square for the bishop. Beautiful coordination of black's pieces. Reducing the number of pieces on the board. And tactics could not, of course, save white here. Black restricts the movement of the, the knight. tactic of deflection and after this it leads to more loss of material for white and white resigned so hopefully you got something from that my dear chess friends it certainly contains some very nice themes and ideas and hopefully we can take them on board ourselves and apply them in our own chess games so once again, I thank you sincerely for taking the time to watch this chess video and I sincerely wish you well with your own chess. Take care and goodbye. I put a spell on you Because you're mine you Ah.